Hi, and welcome to Far From Home with me, Mabel Nainan, your host. And our guest today is Matt Reynolds. Matt and I met at the Evangelical Convening on Immigration in Washington, D.C. in November. Um, I felt that that was a divine appointment because he had connections to India, and we'll talk about that later. Um, also, you know, I could see that he had this heart to serve uh, refugees and immigrants. I was very impressed later on when I looked at his website, the work that he was doing. And uh, it's our privilege to have uh, him share his heart and share what the, about the work he's doing. And so we're so happy to have you. Welcome, Matt. Yeah, it's good to be here. So a little bit about Matt. Um, I'm going to try to read. Uh, I know he's involved in a lot of things, but this is a little bit about him. Before coming to Refuge, Matt served overseas for 13 and a half years with two different organizations, most recently as an area leader for teams serving in various countries in South Asia. And over this time, Matt has also served bivocationally as pastor for six years. He has an MDiv and PhD in spirit, biblical spirituality from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is the same... Um, school from where I'm doing my MA in Theological Studies online right now. Uh, Matt is married to Shannon and they have two children. And in his spare time, Matt enjoys music, reading and tennis. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I'm so glad to be talking with you, Matt. And uh, before we move on, uh, you know, to talk about this subject, tell us a little bit about the work you do with Refuge International. Sure. Yeah, my title is executive director and so my main responsibility is to, to try to ensure that our organization actually accomplishes its its mission and our mission is to glorify God by partnering with local churches to love refugees and immigrants so that's uh that's my role is to really oversee everything in the the organization uh programming staff uh development uh, relations with our board, all, everything that goes into that. Uh, put put another way, Refuge serves the church so that uh, she can engage refugees and immigrants in ministry. So we we really do exist to serve the church and make it as easy as possible for them to enter into ministry with refugees and immigrants. Uh, we we play a a mobilizing and a catalyzing role between churches for ministry among refugees and immigrants. So currently we we partner with 60 plus churches of different denominations, uh, you know, broadly evangelical in the greater Louisville area and uh, 200 plus volunteers that either have served or are serving uh, with us from those different churches. And uh, we, we do this uh, since we're aiming for relationships. That's our hope is that Church members can be connected with refugees and immigrants, and their service will distill into relationships that go beyond the, the actual program. Um, but since since we're trying to make those relationships happen with people that you know don't share our culture, don't speak the same language, have a different religion, there's some ambiguity and uh, awkwardness mm -hmm. that that can't be removed, and it's it's often precisely through that that God does his greatest work in the in the volunteer but we do try to make uh we, we've created different volunteer offerings uh for local church members to make it make the experience as uh as navigable and, and hopefully mm -hmm. as uh gratifying as, as possible so some of those involve english uh some involve just helping new immigrants navigate life in america um some involve children Mm -hmm. uh, some cater to individuals in the church, some to Sunday school classes or community groups, and some uh, even the, the entire church. Wow. You know, um, listening to you and even when I looked at your website, I really thought I should have lived in Louisville so I could volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we would love to have you. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned you're partnering with churches, but um, tell us what is the importance of that? Why? is this model so crucial? Why do you think um, partnering with churches plays such an important role in how um, the, the organization works? 
or in general, how the church, I mean, you know, the body of believers care for them. Right. Yeah. And, and first I, I should acknowledge, I guess that uh, just the, the sheer magnitude of the needs of refugees and immigrants uh, around the world. And also here, uh, it really does exceed uh, the ability, the resources, the, the capacity of the church and, and, um, you know, the earthquake that, that happened in Turkey recently, um, the war in Ukraine and Syria, you know, all of these just, uh, you know, cataclysmic events, uh, the, the refugees that they produce, the millions of refugees they produce, uh, to meet their housing needs, their employment needs, uh, food needs. I mean, those are just some really basic needs. It really is beyond, I think, what, what uh, you know, the church is 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 able to do, but at the same time, uh, the church is not uh, merely called, you know, to do those things. And so, uh, there are other agencies, the UN uh, resettlement agencies here in the U.S. that uh, those employment, housing, resettlement needs. That's that's their main focus. And so, I'm mm-hmm. I'm glad that they're there, and I don't think it's a an either or. But but as Christians, uh, we're we're concerned with uh, eternal impact, and we we have an understanding of the person that goes beyond you know their their physical needs, and so when it comes to you know desiring to see an eternal impact and to see an impact at the level of the soul, uh, at that point you know there's there's no other instrument that that God has provided and that he mentions his word, you know, besides the church to, to meet those needs. And so, so that's really why we, as a, as a Christian nonprofit, um, and just, you know, as, as per our board, that's, that's why we partner with churches because we, there really is no other, uh, pathway or no other arm, you know, by which that, that kind of change can be affected. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the main, uh, the main reason. Wow. Uh, personally, what led you to this field of uh, work or this uh, particular ministry? What's the background? Yeah, so I was in uh, one of the countries uh, that I was uh, to visit some teams when I was serving as area leader uh, there in South Asia. So I was in a, a, a hotel room with my daughter. Uh, she accompanied me for a senior trip, and I got a, a text over WhatsApp with from my wife and she said, Hey, uh, refuge is looking for a, a director. And we were looking at that time, uh, for an opportunity to return to the States and, and be involved in ministry here, uh, as our oldest was getting, you know, approaching the end of high school. And, um, so yeah, so just right there in the hotel room, I, uh, looked at it and applied for it. And, um, and at that time didn't really realize how well of a fit it would be, but, God, God had been, I think, um, raising the the issue or the subject of refugees, uh, just in my own awareness, um, the Rohingya refugee crisis took place, uh, the Rohingya exodus from Myanmar to Bangladesh took place in, I think, August 2017. So we were very, uh, very close, close to that, and the, the headlines were, you know, um, prevalent. Uh, in the new sources at, that we were reading at that time. So I think just uh, we began to you notice them. Uh, we're hearing stories of what God was doing among immigrants in uh, England, in Greece, different places like that. And um, I think just through that began to think, uh, or began to think differently about the strategic importance of, of engaging refugees and immigrants. So, um, so yeah, I'm just, just so, so thankful to be uh, at Refuge, and and in many ways we are doing similar ministries we did overseas. The the the, the peoples are more, mm-hmm. you know, we kind of had a, a yeah. specific people focus overseas. Here it's, you know, all the the nations God's gathered here in, in Louisville, but uh, but we're still looking to partner, you know, with like minded believers uh, across a you know broad spectrum, uh, evangelically speaking. Okay. Uh, and I know that um, you mentioned earlier partnering with local churches, and I was thinking about that. Have you encountered any kind of um, 
skepticism or doubts? Mm. Uh, do they, what kind of fears do they voice? Um, either the congregants or the leaders? Yeah, um, you know, it, it hasn't uh, been too too sticky uh, so far, I guess. Uh, I, I think the issue of, uh, or the subject of refugees increasingly, I think, um, does have a political tinge to it, I guess. And, uh, and depending on, you know, where a person's political sentiments lie, you know, it can, can be a, a charged matter. But, but I think for, for us, uh, I've mostly just heard people that have expressed, I guess, concern as to whether the people, the immigrants we work with are legal or not. I mean, they'll, they'll usually ask it that way or ask, uh, do you work with undocumented immigrants? And uh, that, that's the, that's the main question we hear when it comes to refugees. It's nice to be able to explain to churches that in, in the case of a true refugee, you know, they've been vetted by the UN, by the state department. So you can rest assured, you know, with, um, with refugees, actual refugees, that they're not here illegally. And so if, if that's their only concern, uh, hopefully that, you know, allays it that they're uh, then they're willing to engage. But uh, but sometimes there may be other, uh, you know, other motivations behind that question. So we we um, we generally I think I try to acknowledge the validity of the question. I think a lot of times people are concerned that they might uh, maybe somehow be aiding the illegality if they yeah. you know, engage in ministry with undocumented immigrants. And so um, I think the if they're asking just from a sensitive conscience, I think that's 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 fine. But uh, at, at refuge, our focus is not on the political you know, quandaries that accompany the growing presence of refugees and immigrants in our communities, but really on the fact that they they are here, mm -hmm. and um, and I guess our plea with with churches is that before they consider the you know the legal questions, even though those are important, that they'll consider the question, you know, how how can I love them as myself, you know, because that's that's what God has called us to and. In, in scripture, you know, he talks so often about uh, loving the sojourner or the, the alien or foreigner, de depends on the translation. But in uh, in that day, you know, there weren't, um, I mean, there was still the sense of you're not where, you're not in your country of origin, or you're not where you, you know, you're in our space, not your space, but the um, passports, visas, you know, that's, that's kind of a newer thing. And so, um, so we really try to just bring them back to the, the reality here in Louisville, uh, which is mm -hmm. that we have an increasing number of immigrants and refugees, uh, you know, many legal, some that are not, uh, but we really want to be faithful with the ones that God's put uh, near us. And um, a verse that comes to mind um, regarding this is uh, Acts 17, uh, 26 and 27. And it says, from one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And mm. so I really, I really want churches to first you know, contemplate that, uh, you know, could it be that God has brought these people documented and undocumented uh, here in his sovereignty, according to his plan? Uh, perhaps, you know, my neighbor is uh, is not an accident and and I need to reach out to them or the the, the child that's in school with with my child, you know, that that kind of thing. Um, so. Uh, so, yeah, the, the folks that that do have to deal with those big questions, the legislators, uh, government officials. Um, I, I should pray for them more than I do. You know, uh, that's that's a, a needed job. And those are important questions. But I uh, want to help our, our people wrestle with the question of how I love them as myself first. Wow. You explained that so beautifully. Um, thank you. 
And in a way, you know, with um, refugees and immigrants now being here and in our midst, like you said, in our immediate circles of influence, even that makes all of us kind of missionaries, right? Yes. In our own way. Yes, uh, it does. And it compels us to see them first as made in God's image. Um, and then how we can show love to them because they are strangers and aliens and that's our biblical mandate in a way. Um, so thank you for clarifying that. Um, now in working with them, with refugees and immigrants on such a you know personal basis, and I know that in some of your programs, you openly talk about the Bible and about God. So have you faced any pushback from them? Yeah, I, you know, I, I just had a thought that I, I didn't think of when I read your questions earlier. I think the um, the concern uh, probably comes more along these lines, probably comes more from Americans, maybe uh, those in the resettlement agency world that know about us and know about, you know, our that we are evangelical in nature. I think they're more concerned that we might impose faith on uh, refugees and immigrants or something like that. And uh, the um, our board chair, who's also the CEO of uh, a for-profit uh, company that we partner with, Launch Properties, um, Ben has said, you know, that uh, we don't advocate a forced faith. Mm. And so we can, I can confidently, you know, tell anyone in the government, any resettlement agency, that that's, that's true. We don't advocate a forced faith. We don't, we don't want that. Um, and we also offer our services to any refugee or immigrant uh, without regard for their, or irrespective of their religion or, or mm -hmm. faith, or whether they respond positively to any message that we have you know mm -hmm. um, but we also want our volunteers we don't we don't want to tell our volunteers you have to divorce uh, your service from your motivation uh, yeah. it, it's their faith in Christ that motivates them to want to serve and and we don't want to you know tell them to check that motivation at the door that's the whole reason they they got involved to begin with and so um so yeah that that's just kind of that just just came to me but um uh, could you could you say the question again? I just <laughs> <laughs> no mind. problem. That happens to me a lot. Yeah. Uh, I was asking you about if the refugees and immigrants you work with, if they object or if, okay. do they say <laughs> they're offended when you talk about God or the Bible? Right, right. So yeah, almost never. That that's the short answer. Um, when we were overseas, uh, yes, you know, at times there were there were. There were times when there was just a belligerence, you know, toward toward the gospel, but but here, no. And um, at I, I think it's it's natural when people come from another country. I think two two things happen when when people come from another country and they're resettling here in America. Um, I think on the one hand, there's sometimes an increased openness because everything's in flux, you know, in their lives, and I think that is that's one more reason. Uh, in addition to the fact that God's bringing these nations here, that's one more reason that uh, it's so strategic for the church to engage refugees and immigrants. Um, but another phenomenon that we see when people do come here, say from uh, you know Muslim background, there's also the sense I think as as so much is in flux that they feel the need to you know circle the wagon so to speak and and uh, kind of put up defenses and, you know, make sure that they establish, you know, their faith and the practice of their faith in this new context, mm -hmm. uh, lest they lose it yeah. in the process of reselling. So I think, I think that happens, uh, as, as well, but that's very different from, um, being offended. Mm -hmm. So we have had it happen, uh, for example, with some Muslim, uh, some Muslim Afghan, refugees that we were partnering with. And, and when I say we, I mean our volunteers, but in, in some personal interaction, I know uh, my wife invited some uh, Afghan women to one of our uh, ESL ministries that's hosted on a church site. 
And they immediately uh, ask, now, where's it going to be held at a church? Is there going to be worship? Is, you know, and they ended up, and, and in our case, we do have a Bible component. It's, it's not the main thing, but it is part of the ESL experience kind of during a, 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 a hospitality break. And when they heard that there was even that much, you know, they said, okay, we won't come. But that same person was, uh, is also paired with a volunteer as a, a co-journer, uh, kind of co-journer slash English mentor. And uh, we heard from her after a year that uh, they actually asked her about her faith and what she believed. So it's not, it's not like they were uh, offended to talk about religion at all. They just didn't want to have, be in a position where they were a minority and they felt uh, uh, intimidated, you know, by someone else's faith. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's what we see more often. I think many times it's more, um, more the opposite, I think. And when we saw this overseas as well, where we served that, you know, many immigrants that come here, especially from, I guess, the global South, you know, that kind of uh, part of the world, they're more spiritual than most mm-hmm. Americans. And and by that, I mean that their spirituality is just a natural part of their everyday life. You know, you go to uh, uh, a shop and you you see, you can see from the incense that's burning or a picture of the, the Kaaba, you know, or Arabic, you can, it's very obvious, you know, what religion they have and they're, they're perfectly happy talking about it. But, you know, we Americans tend to uh, compartmentalize our lives and religion is in a very private one. So, so sometimes we can get very offended if someone asks questions, but that's usually not the case. And, and so because of that, that's another message that I find myself uh, frequently trying to get across to church leaders and church members is that uh, not only is God given us access by virtue of bringing these nations to our doorstep, but uh, it's easier than I think most, mm. most uh, American Christians think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can believe that. And, and yes, we do need discernment, uh, wisdom, you know, how to do it. We have our hearts in the right place and we are motivated by the gospel, but also we need to be sensitive. Oops, hold, hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to be sensitive to, you know, to them. And um, I think the Holy Spirit will guide us and give us opportunities um, to tell them about God. So I do believe that. Yeah. Um, you've been mentioning about your time overseas. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit about um, your involvement in ministry overseas. So you lived uh, outside of America for more than a decade. So how did that shape you? How did that affect your walk with God? Yeah. Yeah, it, I think it, it definitely does shape you. And uh, of course, I I read as much in in your book. Um, I think you you don't uh, you don't come back home the same the same place, and even your um, your understanding of home, you know, really changes. I guess over mm-hmm. over time, and um, and then in a sense, you don't quite feel home uh, either place. You know, <laughs> so it's uh, funny how that works. But um, but yeah, I think. Uh, I'll just, I'll just share kind of what I, when you first asked the question, I was thinking through this, I think, you know, on any given day when we were overseas, you know, there might be a feeling of exhilaration, you know, some days because the culture is different. Um, You know, so many new experiences, uh, you're traveling places, you wouldn't have the opportunity to travel. Um, the, The cuisine, I mean, we, we served somewhere where the, you know, maybe in our opinion, the best food in the world, you know, so it was, uh, uh, that was a, a great part of living there. So, so some days are just exhilaration. And then when you add to that, if you, on those times when you really feel like, you know, uh, you're being used by God, you know, that, that adds to that, uh, that feeling of, um, you know, satisfaction and, and just enjoying that. 
But then, you know, other days, just exhaustion and bewilderment, um, you know, adventure, being overwhelmed, rejoicing, sorrow, just, just a, a mix. Mm-hmm. And I think when we first went overseas, um, first the, the, the differences stand out. And, uh, and I think in our case, at least we had a tendency, um, or I had a tendency to kind of assign sinister reasons to the differences, you know, that I saw, uh, they, they, they weren't merely different. They were different and evil, you know, or something because mm-hmm. we, we went there to share the gospel after all, you know, with an unreached people. And so it was easy even to spiritualize, um, you know, some, uh, and of course, and there, and there were, uh, uh, you know, Satan's busy and, and demons yeah. are there, you know, but, but still but not everything is, can be right. attributed to him. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. And so I think initially we, uh, I probably, everything was colored that way, you know, and, and, and the, the beautiful parts didn't stand out as, as much, you know, um, initially my, my guard was very high. Um, I think that was because I really felt vulnerable, um, you know, learning a new language and, uh, new, new means of conveyance. Um, you're just not, not feeling, you know, like a, an expert in, in anything, much of anything, um, uh, if things not transferring. So, um, sticking out, you know, by virtue of, of our skin color. Uh, so we were in a place where mostly, uh, you know, darker skin people and as, uh, at least me and my wife and I, our daughters were adopted. Uh, so they, they actually, they're adopted from the country where we serve. So they, they, they fit in fine. Uh, they probably fit in better when they weren't with us than when they you know, were with us. Cause that, that, uh, raised other questions, but, um, but yeah, I think I felt, um, I was aware that we were different. Mm-hmm. I was aware that we drew attention, you know, whether we, wanted it or not. Um, uh, so, so much so that, uh, I remember one time we came back on furlough. This is, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of funny. We came back on furlough and right out of the airport, we went to like a cracker barrel or something like that. And, um, and, uh, we went in the restaurant and just, uh, I just expected everybody to look my way. <laughs> of course, nobody looked my way, you know, it was just Cracker Barrel for crying out loud, you know, but um, anyway, so, uh, but you get used to that. And then, uh, and I think, you know, in this, in the situation where we were, uh, there was an assumption that because we were from America, we were rich. Um, I didn't feel rich in America necessarily, but uh, we were perceived that way there. And, and in fact, you know, we, we did have a lot more than, than many. So, so I was afraid of being taken advantage of. And um, yeah, so all of that, um, I think you see God often uses an experience, you know, an extended experience in another country um, to uh, identify sin, you know, in, in our lives. Um, that was certainly the case with me. Um, and I think one one sin I struggled with, uh, and, and I've heard of other guys, especially is, uh, anger. Um, just, I don't know that, that being in another culture and feeling vulnerable and feeling you need to prove yourself, it just really brought it out. But, um, but I think, uh, uh, two, two anecdotes, uh, came to mind. So one early on, I, you know, I was trying to learn the language and, uh, and of course we, we took taxis, you know, different times and, and so I uh, had my guard really high, you know, and um, I remember one day I was in a taxi. I thought I knew where I was going and I was trying to communicate, you know, in the local language. And and after a while, I thought we should be there by now, you know, and and, and instantly I thought this guy is taking. Pay more. And so I got upset, you know, we went round and around and I'm saying, no, turn here, turn here. Well, in the end, you know, I was the one that took us for, for a long ride. And, uh, you know, because I, I was wrong, you know, and he was, he was right. And he wasn't, uh, 
he was just doing his job. And so, um, and there was another time when uh, I was, this was after we'd lived there a number of years and I was um, more or less fluent in the language, certainly conversational. And uh, we were in a mall and I, I spoke to a man in the language and said, you know, is this the end of the line? And he turned around to me and he said, uh, it's okay. I speak English. And I, I thought, oh. yeah, cause we, we would hear that a lot. And, <laughs> and so I thought, uh, not, not now, you know, not after all this time. So I spoke again, you know, the local language. And, uh, and again, he said, I'm sorry, sir, would you, would you please just speak in English? And, and so then I started getting really, you know, getting angry, you know, like, why will he not, you know, surely. So I tried saying it another way. And then he said, uh, he said, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm from Canada. I don't <laughs> speak, you know, this language, even though he looked like he should. Yeah. And, uh, and then I felt, you know, about this small and, uh, anyway, so, uh, but yeah, over time you see the beauty, the warmth of the people, uh, hospitality, um, family values, um, just, just so, so much the respect and the care for elders. And this is where we were. Um, and the Bible came alive, alive in a new way as well. Um, I think just being in a culture that was much closer to, you know, biblical culture, um, in the you know, near, near East, um, I think there were just parts of scripture that, that came alive that, that mm, didn't, yeah. didn't before. Um, and like you said, God uses all these experiences, um, to shape us, to prune us, yes. <laughs> to draw us closer to him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and while you were talking, you mentioned your children adopted, uh, children. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, um, they look, they don't look like you, right? So, how do you navigate that, you know, as white parents, children of color? Uh, was it uh, easier or more difficult overseas and here? Yeah, you know, thank, thankfully, I wouldn't say it was hard, really, either either place. Um, I think here in America, I, I'd say really probably here and overseas uh, in our the, the country where we served, I'd say mostly our daughters have opened doors for us. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they've, they've ingratiated us, especially to people of, of color uh, and, and kind of given us an entree that we would not have had. You know, I think people have been more favorably disposed toward us because of them. Um, and uh, that, that might not have been true, you know, a, generation or two ago, you know, maybe in, in America, but, um, but where we served, I think, um, maybe what was more different for people was when they saw us together, you know, dark skinned children, white skinned, uh, parents, especially when they were little, uh, because it's like, here's this white skinned adult with a brown skinned baby or, or toddler, you know, and, um, one time a guy literally just stopped in his tracks, you know, on the street and was just like, <laughs> what's going on here? You know? And, uh, uh, but many times even there, I think they assumed like when they heard they were adopted, they assumed that we had just done it, you know, like as an act of charity, mm. uh, not, not thinking that, Oh, this couple might be infertile and, and there's no other way they can have children, you know? And so, um, so yeah, in general, I think they really broke the ice for us, and uh, and and actually, God used um, the adoption of our oldest to actually call us to that particular country. Mm. Uh, we we had not been considering that country. We felt called, you know, to overseas service, overseas ministry, but we hadn't narrowed, you know, hadn't hadn't really seriously considered job request in that country and God used her adoption to, to draw us in that direction. Yep. He, he often works in ways we don't understand at that time, but so mysterious. And, you know, as you were talking about your experience and your life, uh, it just occurred to me that even you being an immigrant overseas and adopting children from there and all of that prepared you in a way to understand and serve immigrants now 
and because you yes. know how they feel and you know how difficult it is to learn a language so you've been there and yeah. i feel like that gives you an advantage <laughs> in a way yes right yeah uh, I, i think like when we were learning language um and of course it is uh i think here in america you know sometimes it's uh it's inconvenient to try to communicate with someone who can't speak english very well mm -hmm. uh, but we we saw that on the other side you know uh, overseas and uh and of course the same was true i mean we couldn't communicate so if someone spoke english they'd much rather speak english to us than you know hear us uh struggle with us in their own language you know uh but but there were those people that um you know would slow their rate of speech down uh that would speak in the language we were trying to learn and that was yeah that was really precious and it really yeah. really meant a lot yeah because it's not just learning a language it's about connecting with them it's about even for for us to be able to find our way in a new country and can be frustrating when no one understands you or you don't understand them yeah. because it could be something as simple as you know in the market i want something or i want to go from here to there but i'm not able to communicate that and i mean i speak english so i didn't have a problem here but sometimes i think about immigrants and refugees coming here with no knowledge of english mm -hmm. it is very difficult for them even emotionally to navigate that so offering um english classes can be a huge help right or speaking with them or teaching them english is such a an important part of that ministry yes yeah 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 it really is <laughs> so last question um you know you've been on both sides right serving abroad and here now working with uh, immigrants so tell us uh, and we have about 2 3 minutes here um tell us about the changing face of missions today how have they changed yeah um i i think that the biggest change is just that it's not as difficult uh to engage the nations as it as it used to be um you know previously if you wanted to reach unreached people groups and i, and I still think that's um you know the urgent need in in missions and and just the great commission to to take the gospel to people that haven't heard and don't have access to it but previously the really the only way to do that was to to send people you know from here to there and so very expensive uh for the church that sends mm -hmm. uh a lot of sacrifice for the person that goes uh both in leaving but then also once they're there and learning the language uh you know very expensive and so i think the the big it's not that nothing's changed with the great commission you know to to get the gospel to those that haven't heard but god has brought the nations here and so it doesn't you know it costs a fraction uh to reach people in your own city that are from those nations and i i'm i'll just throw out some names like here in louisville there are uh you know vietnamese bosnian somalis congolese afghans yeah. cubans ukrainians um you know some of those nations you'd be hard pressed even if you wanted to send a person even if they wanted yeah. to go you'd be hard pressed to get a visa even to get in mm -hmm. and and so uh, i really do think that just the change in our world that again is under god's sovereignty it really does call for the church to rethink mm -hmm. what foreign missions is i think previously there were kind of categories of local missions foreign missions but those are really a lot more fluid than than they than they were before and so i think that uh and then the other big difference i think is that american church members previously may have primarily been senders or mm -hmm. prayers and i and i'm not i'm not one that feels that there's the statement everybody's a missionary is necessarily true or helpful yeah. uh but in the sense now that every church member can mm -hmm. engage yeah people from these nations like mm -hmm. they really can have an impact and uh that's different and so mm -hmm. i think uh i really want the average church member to understand that yes you know even if you're not called to be a full-time missionary or cross cultures for the whole of a day 
you know, he can use an hour or two of your time every week to make a big impact in the lives of uh, the life of one person or the li- lives of a family. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I've been interviewing a few refugees and immigrants and they tell me, you know, uh, it could be something as simple as when they first landed in America, this lady drove them uh, to an apartment that was set up and then came back every week to help her shop for her groceries or take her around and no ulterior motives there, just to love them and help them get settled. And that's something that most of us can do. It's not a special skill that you need to have. Uh, Or another woman had mentioned how she knew no English, Vietnamese, but it was her elementary school teacher who took a special interest in her, made sure after school, uh, you know, that she would uh, be fluent in English. So Mm. she took that extra step. And so it's just the power of that one individual And Mm. these, uh, and I know for sure that I remember those people who even did that little thing for me because it makes such a huge difference. It does. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much for talking with us today, Matt. We learned so much from you, from your experience and knowledge. Um, And uh, I hope that listeners, you know, who listen to you are encouraged to um, step out of their comfort zone, reach out to someone, or maybe even churches can partner with local organizations to carry out really, um, you know, Jesus's message and his heart for strangers that if we, mm-hmm. and he says that in Matthew, that you do that for them, it's it's as if you've done it for me. Yes. That is our call. Um, thank you for speaking with us. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. <laughs>